Okay, I think we can start. So it's my pleasure to uh, to have here Tatiana Buba from University of Helsinki. And uh, so um, she's a postdoc there uh, since uh, many years and she obtained uh, her PhD at uh, uh, University of uh, Ferrara, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> and yes. uh, so uh, she's going to speak about um, deep learning and shear let's apply to uh, limited angle tomography. Please, Tatiana. Thank you, Matteo, and thank you for uh, all of you for having me today over Zoom and uh, hopefully at some point in Genoa. And uh, so the topic of today is learning the invisible limited angle tomography, shearlets and deep learning. I'll try to go full screen. Okay, good. Maybe do like this. Great. And uh, this has been uh, a joint work that uh, we have been carrying out uh, with uh, um, Matthias Samuli, that are my advisor at the University of Helsinki, uh, Gita Coutinho and Maximilian Martz, that are at the TU Berlin, and they are uh, definitely expert uh, uh, in shearlet uh, and imaging in general. And then Wojciech and Vignesh that uh, are from the Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin, and uh, they have very many expertise in deep learning. So when this project started, we kind of uh, merged together the expertise of uh, each one of these group, ours being mostly in uh, computer tomography and uh, sparse uh, regularization in, uh, in, in tomography. Uh, so, the, I'll start by reviewing uh, uh, why limited angle tomography is a special ill uh, posed inverse problem, and, um, and then I'll move on to why shearlets come into play and are an efficient tool for these kind of problems. Just uh, to be sure that we are all on the same page, um, I recall that mathematically a CT scanner basically samples the Radon transform in two dimensions, which is uh, the setting that we, uh, we stick to for this talk. And uh, we have uh, generally an X-ray source here in orange that is allowed to rotate all around the object, which is this uh, blob here in, uh, in gray. And then we have a detector that uh, measures the incoming uh, X-ray radiation that is attenuated by the object in the middle. So our task is that we want to uh, recover the scanned object or its attenuation values from the measured that data, uh, which are modeled by the Radon transform. And this is especially a challenging inverse problem where uh, theta and s, so the parameters sampling the angles and s, which is uh, sampling here the detector cell, basically, are scarcely sampled. And, uh, what is done in, uh, in practice uh, is that uh, we uh, can discretize uh, the object. Usually we use pixels for this, and then we discretize the, um, the Radon transform in some ways. So you can do it straightforwardly, just discretizing the line integrals, but there are also more sophisticated techniques to do this. And then we have our data Y, which are modeled through this uh, matrix or operator, our uh, object that we want to reconstruct, plus some noise that is always unavoidable on the measurements uh, we are carrying out. There are um, different techniques to solve these problems. Uh, Besides uh, using filter adverse projection, which is an efficient technique to when uh, the number of angles and uh, detector cells is uh, highly densely sampled. Um, when, you, when we are dealing with computed tomography in different scenarios, especially when it is uh, um, when it is scarcely sampled, we can use iterative reconstruction techniques and in particular regularization, which is uh, the one which is interesting for uh, the talk of today. So what we do is that we cast our problem as uh, a minimization one, where our function we are minimizing over is uh, mm, is given by a data mismatch terms that express fidelity towards the data we are actually measuring, uh, plus some regularization term, which uh, which should express our uh, possible a priori knowledge on uh, the object itself. Uh, classical examples is Tikhonov or generalized Tikhonov, where we, this guy here is an L2 norm, or uh, the one we are interested in, in today's talk is an L1 norm, where L is a suitable operator, and this is the case of sparse regularization. 
And often in a tomographic problem, it is also very important to, to include a non-negativity constraint to force the object to have all positive elements because this is consistent with the physics of the problem at hand. So we are just saying that the, uh, the object is not emitting itself in this case. Okay, so this applies uh, in, in general to the case where we uh, where we can densely sample the uh, the angle around uh, the target, but the topic of today is limited angle tomography, which is a problem that arises when uh, the angular range is uh, limited uh, between a certain interval and. Um, uh, this happens in many applications. Uh, one you can think about is, for instance, uh, uh, luggage scanning at the airport. But another uh, example is breast tomosynthesis. And uh, maybe one that is a uh, um, uh, bit more challenging is electron tomography. Uh, which combines with other issues in inverse problems. But as you see, limited angle tomography is just not a uh, mathematical uh, toy example. It actually is appears in many practical uh, applications in everyday life. So what happens there is uh, that if we think about um, uh, this is uh, um, one slice of an abdominal, uh, the abdomen, uh, of the abdomen of a human being uh, is a simulation of it, of course. Uh, when we have all the angles, so it means our phi here is 90 degrees, so that we are spanning from minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees. So we are doing a Radon transform with 180 uh, degree angles. Then the filter and breath projection uh, allows you to recover pretty much the whole information about the object. But uh, when we start uh, lowering this phi, so for instance, we have 75 and then we go lower to 60 and uh, 45, so 30 degrees, and then we go to the critical case of 15 degrees, we see that at least with the filter by projection, uh, um, our information and our reconstruction becomes more and more um, less informative, we can't uh, really have a, a fine structure well uh, detected. Uh, but we also notice that uh, some boundaries uh, still remain visible. For instance, it's here in this case. So if you go back to this case, which is probably a bit less extreme, you see it uh, more explicitly. And the other thing that we notice is that uh, the, the missing wedge, so the parts uh, which we fail to recover because uh, it's not in the, in the data, uh, creates some striking artifacts which are actually, um, which are actually um, a marked um, uh, the characteristic of this kind of application when we use filter back projection to reconstruct from uh, limited angle tomography data. Uh, and, uh, uh, these um, these uh, uh, artifacts that appears makes the um, inver the inverse problems we are treating even more ill posed than the uh, than the standard uh, computer tomography one. So uh, the good news uh, is that uh, um, if we use some micro local analysis and theory from the wavefront set, uh, there are uh, two papers. One. Um, bit older one, but very seminal paper in, in, uh, in this field by um, Todd Quinto from 1993, which characterized exactly uh, this kind of uh, singularities in the sinogram space, and basically tells you that uh, you can divide the, uh, the, the wedges that are visible from the ones that are invisible uh, by classifying uh, uh, the singularities. So. Uh, both visible are the singularities that are tangent to the sampled lines, and the other ones, so the ones that uh, fail to be tangent to the sampled lines, are called the invisible. Okay, so if we think of a practical example here with the um, with the um, Shep Logan Phantom, uh, what we what we have is that if uh, we are basically sampling the angles here, so this is the blue part that is going to be visible. Uh, from my data when I reconstruct it, and all the rest, so this red part here, is going to be uh, invisible because it's not contained in the data, basically. And uh, this means that the singularities are not tangent to the sampled lines. And uh, there is a more recent result uh, by 
Jürgen Frickel and still uh, Todd Quinto from 2013 that uh, characterize this same result in the filter by projection domain and uh, uh, and then works a bit on how to reduce this freaking artifact that we observed before. So this for us is a seminal paper uh, because it basically gives motivation and uh, um, and this splitting into visible and invisible uh, singularities is the starting point for our work. Uh, one step further is uh, uh, considering shearlets. Um, so shearlets are a fairly recent, have been fairly recent uh, introduced in um, in harmonic analysis, and I'm sure. Uh, many of you are actually familiar with this, but uh, uh, for those who never heard of Shirlet before, uh, the idea is that we have a multidimensional signal that allows us to describe any signal, for instance, in our case, our images, uh, by using building blocks that are built with respect to certain uh, to a certain family of generating function. Uh, if you think of the most classical example where we we represent um, a signal in a different basis by having coefficient that uh, in a certain um, in a different basis from the one we are using for our image you can think of Fourier series where our um, basis function are sines and cosines uh, a step forward in this is to consider wavelet system where our uh, basis function are allowed to uh, to shrink and dilate um, so that we have uh, uh, element in the basis that are allowed to um, to move around the plane and to be localized, which is uh, the feature that was missing with Fourier series. So shearlets are now an uh, um, a refinement of wavelet, where we not only uh, can shrink and enlarge the element, uh, the basis element, uh, as much as we like, and move them around with the translation parameter, but we have also an additional element. Uh, which is the shearing matrix here that allow to basically tilt our objects. And uh, the scaling that we do compared to the one that one does with the shearlet is anisotropic and not isotropic anymore like it's done in wavelet. So basically uh, our system is generated by function looking like this. And the support is given by, uh, is something that is becomes uh, um, elongated as much as we wish and is basically need a life you could define it by looking at this. Okay, the definition I have in this slide is for discrete shearlet system, but uh, there is a, a continuous set in theory where the parameters are not uh, sampled in, um, in the integers, but in the real uh, numbers. And uh, this is a very basic construction and there are uh, more evolved ones um, for instance, the cone adapted shearlet system, which are the ones we are going to use today. And then you can have generators that are either compactly supported or band limited. So you can uh, construct very diverse uh, systems. The reason why we are interested in this kind of uh, multidimensional systems is uh, uh, that uh, it has been proved that shearlet can uh, uh, resolve the wavefront set. So uh, the wavefront set, imagine it as uh, uh, you have information of all the singularities, uh, uh, of the singularities and their directions. And shearlet, uh, when we say that shearlet uh, uh, completely resolve the wavefront set, it means that by looking at the decay of the shearlet coefficient, uh, we can identify the singular, not only the singularities, but also their directions. And this for us is uh, fundamental because we're going to see that this, uh, if we have information about the wavefront set, then we can connect this with the result from uh, Quinto and uh, combine them to have very strong information uh, in the Shirley domain about uh, uh, the object we wish to reconstruct. And uh, why do we use shearlet and not wavelets? Is because wavelets can only characterize the singular support of our function and not uh, and don't have access to any directional information. Okay, so this is the key point for using shearlet in uh, in this work. Um, um, the next step that we need uh, to do uh, is that uh, in 2014, there is another uh, very fundamental work that connects uh, a family of, uh, um, of a multidimensional uh, system very similar to Shearlet called the curvelets. 
uh, and limited angle tomography and the characterization of singularities that Quinto did in 1993. And it is still um, a work by Jürgen Frickel. So uh, first of all, what is the difference between curvelet and shearlets? Well, basically it, uh, it differs from, uh, um, if we go back to the definition of shearlet, instead of having uh, a shearing matrix, curvelet have a rotation matrix. So the parameter is the angle itself. And the connection between the shearing and the, and the rotation here is just that the shearing is basically the tangent of the angle of rotation. So they are closely connected. And uh, at this point, it shouldn't be surprising that uh, basically for curvelet, you can prove the same result on uh, um, resolving the wave from set as from shearlet. Uh, the important part here, however, is that in this paper, Frickel proved that uh, uh, the index set of curvelets uh, can be split into a part that is visible under the limited uh, uh, angle Radon transform and the part which is invisible. And this is done by using the Fourier slice theorem. So basically, uh, this, uh, this means that if we look now at the representation in the frequency plane of this uh, uh, these are the cone adapted shearlet, these ones in the middle. Um, what, what we have is that we can uh, explicitly know from the, directly from the Radon transform and the direction we sampled, which one is going to be the uh, curvelet or shearlet coefficient that uh, are visible, so that are non-zero uh, under the Radon transform, and the one that are zero. So if we now um, take into consideration the, the Shep Logan figure we had before, this corresponds to having these red parts to be invisible. So the, if you recall, we were sampling from this part here. So, and uh, the rest is going to be invisible. And then since in this case, uh, and there are going to be also some, um, depending on how the wedge is chosen, some of these might be semi-visible. So the wedges line basically lies in between uh, supporting element of the, of the shearlet transform. OK, and why is this relevant for us? Well, uh, basically, we can then split uh, when we use this sort of reconstruction formula to recover our object from uh, the building blocks. So these are the shearlet coefficients. Uh, we can split uh, them into the visible ones and the invisible ones, which we can very reliably identify once more from the Radon transform. And once we do this, if we plug it in this information into a standard synthesis uh, regularization, uh, sparsity promoting regularization like the one uh, given here, we have that we have a very strong redu uh, red uh, dimension reduction because we know that these coefficients that we call invisible are going to be zero. So there is no use in keeping this term. Okay. And if you now look at this uh, regularization term here, you're going to see that it's very similar to uh, one of the first slides I had today. So this is again our uh, data mismatch term, and this is uh, the regularization term in R1 norm. And uh, uh, this regularized directly on the shielded coefficient, and then to recover the actual target, we apply the transpose of the shielded transform. Uh, the only drawback of this, uh, of this formulation is that uh, we can't include the, positi the positivity constraint, which is actually pretty vital for um, uh, computer tomography. And uh, uh, so it's a strong result, but maybe we could, do, uh, we could improve it a bit for our application. Um, OK. So this is pretty much uh, the, uh, the idea uh, that we had when we started the, the project. Uh, so we had in mind quinto results. We knew uh, about uh, Shiller's ability to resolve the wave from set. And we wanted to face a limited angle problem. And um, so what we had is that uh, there are parts of the wave from set that are available here and there, depending on how I do my uh, measurements. and. Uh, once more, we know that shearlet are proven to resolve the wave from set. So our idea was, uh, let's use shearlet coefficient to fill in the missing parts of the wave from set. So we imagine to work in the, in the shearlet domain, and we want to somehow connect, uh, so fill in, as I said in the slide, these parts of the wave from set, which are not available because they are missing in the data when we do the measurements. And, uh, so our idea would be, let's do the best we can do uh, so far to reconstruct uh, from limited angle data. This would be having an L1 
uh, sparsity promoting uh, re minimization or reconstruction. Then uh, I know that uh, I will have some coefficient uh, that are visible and some that are invisible. Thanks for to Quinto and Trickle's results. Uh, I will explain what this is, this can be rough. Now uh, we just split our coefficient in two sets. And then the next step is that I fill in the missing coefficient and I somewhat get a reconstruction that is in painted, but is in painting in the shielded domain. Okay. So our points here was uh, how do I do this step? Um, and uh, the disclaimer is that at the very beginning of this project, which was uh, uh, almost three years ago, uh, we didn't want, our goal wasn't to use deep learning, uh, but that's how uh, we ended up solving the problem. Um, so let's see how. Okay, first of all, uh, what, do, what do I mean when I say shearlet cube? So from a numerical point of view, whenever we have one of the softwares available for uh, computing the shearlet transform, it could be the shearlet toolbox or the shear lab, uh, whatever, um, we get that from our image, uh, two-dimensional image, we get basically with a um, tensor, here, uh, where each of the uh, each of the um, two-dimensional elements have the same size of the original image, and this capital L here, so the number of these slices that we have, are the subbands uh, corresponding to the inner product with the uh, basis element of the Shirlet family. Okay, so if you are familiar with well with wavelet, for instance, you should recall that starting from an image like this, you would have just the, your output applying a wavelet transform would be just one image of the same size, where the uh, different subbands are uh, are placed together in a smart way. Okay, while with Shirlets, you basically get as many uh, layers, let's say, let's call them layers, uh, as subbands you are considering. So as many scales and direction per scale you ask your software to compute. So if now we uh, place all these uh, uh, shearlet coefficients, so basically each of these uh, images contains the shearlet coefficient, this would be this one, this one and this one according to this direction here. Uh, so if we place them uh, one after the other, so we stack them along the Z direction, uh, this is what we, we call the shearlet cube, okay? And uh, why is convenient or why did we want to do that is that uh, if we sort the coefficient in a certain way, uh, then uh, for instance, if I consider these uh, um, um, this very easy target here where we have a, a circle with a neat jump between zero and one for the boundary. Then when I sort the coefficient by plugging in this uh, um, shearlet cube, then we can observe that this, uh, there is a very, um, there is a specific structure in each scale. So this is the highest scale, for instance. And you see that uh, this seems to be a consistent uh, behavior. So if you would try something different from this, you would, uh, uh, and we are going to see it, you're going to, you would see uh, the same behavior, just a bit uh, more messy. Uh, but even most importantly, and uh, sorry, I, I, I move it here. Um, if you now uh, do the same, uh, but uh, for the limited angle tomography uh, case, so you imagine that you are not something all around the target, but you have just a wage, you sample, uh, from, uh, then uh, you can notice uh, if you compute then this uh, shearlet transform and then make the shearlet cube that uh, correspondingly to the parts that are not sampled, then you have holes. And why do you have holes? Because we know that all shearlet coefficients are zero. And this is thanks to the result by Frickel Quinto, by Frickel. Uh, so basically, we see that the behavior is the same, but we have these holes or jumps into in in the direction so uh when we did this uh, our first idea was uh, okay then uh, we see this very nice uh, structure which we call candy wrap because it resembles the the wrap of the at the ending of 
a candy. Um, can we enforce continuity? Can we enforce continuity based on these parts of the of the candy wrap, which would practically mean, in some form, that we enforce continuity of the way from set? Uh, and if if we do this, uh, can we do this uh, uh, basically and crafting it? Is it too complicated? Uh, well. Um, the answer is yes and no. I mean, depending on what tools you want to use. So um, when we started this project, uh, Samuli, uh, especially Samuli, one of my advisors, was, uh, had a strong requirement that was don't, let's not use PDE to model this behavior. So he wanted to, uh, to write a regularization term in the variational uh, approach meaning of it. So, um, and using pretty much fertile-like ideas. So we couldn't resolve to those tools. And then what we were left with is that what we have is actually very, very difficult to, uh, to put into a mathematical idea with this uh, constraint. Uh, first of all, because uh, when I showed you the circle, uh, that was uh, a bit of, uh, um, of cheating because it's, as I said before, this is a very easy, uh, very easy target and the jump between inside and outside this circle is one, which makes it easier to have such, uh, let's say, neat shielded coefficient in practice. Uh, if we Consider something like the Shap-Logan phantom, and we try to compute the, the Schiller coefficient. They are not going to be as neat. So all these uh, um, uh, smaller Schiller coefficient that you see here are uh, are there. Even though the theory tells us they shouldn't be there. And if you try to threshold them, just saying, okay, let's get rid of everything. Uh, uh, above or below a certain threshold, then you either are going to save just the outer skull where the jump between intensities is the, uh, is the higher one, and so you're going to lose the details inside, or if you try to keep the information inside the skull, then uh, you're going to see this. So we tried for a while and eventually we managed to find a way to clean the shearlet cube, so to have something neater, and the trick is that we used complex shearlets. But, uh, but still, uh, this was uh, still too difficult to grasp mathematically in a simple enough way. Uh, so what we did is that uh, it was basically spring of 2017, and uh, it was uh, uh, deep learning and the convolution neural network were exploding in our inverse problems community. So we said, well, maybe if we train a neural network uh, to fill in the graphs of the wavefront set, uh, we are going to uh, find something nice and uh, this approach could could work. So we, we tried and we finally go for that way. And uh, how we um, we started is that we tried to verify uh, the concept of uh, visibility and invisibility and we tried to, to cheat a bit to see whether this idea could, could go anywhere. Uh, how we did this? So this is our ground truth. Uh, if you see the reconstruction with the filter at back projection is uh, that you're going to see these striking uh, artifacts as we saw to earlier. If you use uh, an L1 Shearlet uh, uh, regularization approach, you're going to see that uh, the reconstruction improves a lot because you suppress way more noise and the striking artifacts are gone. So now, uh, we try to trick the system. So we, we use the filter by projection and we use the uh, visible coefficient of the Shearlet transform computed from the filter by projection. And we summed with the Shearlet, uh, mm, Shearlet coefficient that for us are invisible, but that in this case we have because we have the ground truth. Uh, and we sum them together. And here it's what you see. So you can nicely recover the boundary of the object, but the uh, but the striking artifacts are still there. So the next step was what if instead of using the uh, L1, uh, instead of using the FPP reconstruction, I used the L1 Shearlet reconstruction, which was very nice uh, elsewhere. And I combine with uh, the invisible coefficient that now I have, I have access to, but uh, in principle, I don't have. Would this make a better reconstruction? And uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, seems like it's working. And uh, this was our idea. So if only we would have access in some way to the invisible coefficient, uh, and um, we would have a nice reconstruction. So the idea was, let's learn the invisible coefficient by uh, building a network that somehow enforces uh, the candy wrap uh, 
uh, geometry we observed, which we called candy wrap prior. And uh, a spoiler, this is how the solution uh, for this case would, would look like with our uh, with the invisible coefficient inferred by our network. So quite close to the, uh, the one we obtained by cheating. Okay, so uh, now I will present our work. Back then when we started this work, we was pretty much the, the literature that was uh, available and minimum for our problem. Of course, if we would do the literature review now, we would find way more papers on uh, deep learning, convolutional neural networks, and limited angle tomography. Uh, but back then, the paper that was uh, uh, that was doing something very close uh, to what we had in mind was this paper from Gu and Ye, uh, which was using a UNET to uh, basically removing artifacts uh, from limited angles um, uh, reconstruction by basically removing the striking artifact after a filter back projection reconstruction. And it was, it was doing it uh, with a similar idea to ours. So it, they cited like a multi-scale wavelets, they are actually contourlets. And, uh, uh, and the idea was exactly to work in the uh, wavelet slash contourlet domain to remove the striking artifacts. So not just on the post-processed image. Okay. So uh, starting from this paper and, uh, um, and the result we had uh, from previous paper, uh, we, uh, we made some observation. First of all, uh, when we do the noising on the filter back projection, we noticed or its coefficient like this contourlet coefficient of the filter back projection, uh, we have some limitations. First of all, we are processing the entire image. We don't have full control on the features that are modified. Um, to which extent can we interpret what we are doing? And uh, most importantly, the neural networks needs to learn a lot of streaking artifacts and noise to, to perform well. So uh, at least for our problem, we felt like we could do a bit better. So for instance, we could learn only the invisible boundaries uh, because we know that the visible boundaries we can access and rely on them. And it's a very good uh, information we can have. And uh, we want to build a network that follows the candy wrap structure because this is something we enforced, we noticed, and uh, might be um, easy enough to enforce with a network. Okay, so the approach we, uh, we proposed is this one. It's divided in three steps. The first step is doing uh, recover the visible. And this means that we apply the best available classical solution, which produces us uh, the noise, the reconstruction with very little artifacts. And most importantly, it gives a very neat information about the, conf the coefficients that are visible. So these are reliable and uh, almost perfect. And the coefficients that are invisible. So these are almost zero. It's almost zero when you compute them numerically. So here we basically apply the result from Frickel and, uh, um, and Quinto. Then we learn the invisible part. So we do supervised learning on the invisible coefficient. So the input to the network is the whole stack of coefficient, but the output is just the invisible ones, okay? And then we put everything together. So we combine the invisible learn coefficient with the visible ones we computed at the step at the first step, and then we have our uh, our reconstruction. Uh, this is the same thing, but with pictures. So maybe it's a bit more uh, intuitive. So we start with a sinogram that has uh, some missing angles here and here. Uh, we use the ADMM to reconstruct and do the first step. Once we have our reconstruction, we compute the shielded coefficient and we put them in the shielded cube. And this blue part here symbolize the missing ones. We feed this cube into our network called phantom net. We learn the invisible coefficient. So what we have as an output are just the uh, learned invisible coefficient. We combine the gray part with the red one. The gray is the part that we trust before and we get this uh, new shielded cube with the filled in information. Then we apply the, shield, the transpose of the shielded transform and we recover the original image. Okay, uh, and uh, briefly about the network. Um, so it's a convolutional neural network uh, that has a structure of a UNET. Uh, the network and it's minimizing over the empirical risk. So it's very standard loss function. And the network itself is uh, nothing fancy, 
Okay, so the main idea is not to propose a very uh, advanced network, it was just to combine variational regularization with network in a, in a way that we could use uh, the knowledge we have about these particular inverse problems. Uh, uh, the network itself, as I said, has um, some transition down and up, which is uh, to reduce the dimension and go up again. And then the main feature is this trim dense block, which are anyway nothing, um, nothing too fancy. Um, okay, I will, I will probably go on because I realized I'm quite uh, behind schedule. And uh, yes, so uh, the, the, as I said, the idea is that we want to combine the model-based uh, approach that we have been using basically so far with uh, a data-driven approach where we learn only what we actually need to learn. And uh, um, and this it gives, uh, uh, compared to the learning approach of uh, Gu and Ye, for instance, we have a better performance because we have a better input because we don't use the FPP, we use the L1 uh, regularization uh, reconstruction. We do not process the entire image, okay? So uh, we have a less blurring by the UNAT and fewer uh, unwanted artifacts. And this uh, offers for better generalization. Um, itself. The main disadvantage is that we pay quite a lot the price of having a better input because we have to solve the L1 minimization problem for all the example in the training set, which requires a lot of time. Okay. And um, yeah, some, some results. We tested it uh, on the Mayo Clinic data. Uh, this provides uh, slices, a bit over 2,000 slices uh, concerning the 10 patients. Uh, they are sized 512 times 512. We use nine patients for training and one patient for testing. And we considered uh, two different scenario. And I think I included results just for the, the more interesting one. So there, where there is a missing wedge of 60 degree in fan bean geometry. And then uh, we test the generalization properties of our method on to this uh, lotus root data, uh, which we actually measured in the micro CT that we have in Helsinki. Uh, so what does this mean is that we train the network only on the Mayo Clinic data. So the lotus root data has never been seen by the network. And we try to reconstruct nonetheless the lotus root. Uh, same scenarios and uh, I have the data uh, from the 60 degree missing web. We use Astra toolbox to simulate the radon transform, the fan bean geometry, and this alpha shearlet transform toolbox uh, for the shearlet transform using five scales uh, and in to a total of 59 subbands. Uh, okay, some results. So uh, the ground truth is here uh, on the, well, my left, <laughs> and uh, uh, and here are gonna update the reconstruction. So this is the filter by projection. We commented on this kind of reconstruction many times. We have streaking artifacts and basically uh, um, not such a clear reconstruction where we don't have the data as theory tells us. Uh, this is a reconstruction with total variation, which improves a lot uh, on the striking artifacts. It removes them them quite nicely. But if you look at these details here, you're gonna notice that uh, it's quite a staircase as we know that total variation tends to do. Uh, in contrast, uh, the Shillet reconstruction, which is uh, um, somewhat equivalent to total variation in some regards, uh, uh, gives us uh, the same nice uh, uh, reconstruction with our striking artifacts, uh, and it's not as stair um, a staircase and total variation. And then we compare with a bunch of uh, neural network approaches. This is what the Gu and Ye um, network does. We add the original codes from, the, from Gu and Ye. So uh, this is exactly their network, uh, which is, uh, we see that it does quite a nice job, but not really on the boundaries here and some details inside. Uh, this is uh, um, how our network performs. Uh, working on the uh, filtered back projection, okay? So this means that the input to the network is no longer um, shielded coefficients, it's the filtered back projection, but the structure of the UNET is the same, it just changes what we give as an input. And uh, this is what we obtain if we consider the shielded coefficient of the filtered back projection, which is, uh, uh, as you see, a bit worse than before. And uh, uh, 
And finally, this is our approach. So we basically work on the Shearley coefficient of the Shearlet reconstruction, which uh, by far gets the, the best reconstruction if you look at these details here and Nancy calls the boundary here. Uh, and then, as I promised, we see how uh, this generalized to the lotus root data. So again, the network has been trained on the on the lotus uh, on the um, Mayo Clinic data, and we apply to this lotus root, which is a target, which is challenging. But there's different uh, different stuff in it. This is a chart. This is a um, pencil, and these are match edits. Uh, and then these are like the holes inside the lotus root, and. Um, we see that uh, with the filter back projection, same uh, observation as before, similar to wavelet, which uh, result to be very, uh, very cartoon-like. Uh, this is the reconstruction with shearlet, so uh, less staircase, but still not uh, still very strong artifacts here, I would say. Uh, this is the network by Guanye, which. Uh, does not work as well as with the Mayo data. Um, this is our network on the shielded coefficient of the field back projection. Uh, all in all, is it's still like presenting quite many artifacts. And finally, this is our approach, which improves, uh, uh, which performs definitely better than the others. Uh, if you especially look at artifacts here and here as before. Okay, so uh, to conclude, the idea of this work was to exploit a fundamental result by, by Frequel, uh, which tells us that whenever we're dealing with limited angle tomography, uh, we uh, have access to a visible part and uh, an invisible uh, part uh, corresponding to the sampled wedge and the, uh, the wedge that is not sampled. And this basically, uh, and when we use L1 uh, minimization, as Frequel did with curvelets, we have access to the visible part of the wavefront set, and we can neglect the visible part because we know that it's invisible under the Radon transform. So our idea was then to learn the invisible part by using a convolutional neural network, uh, because this would allow to solve a sort of 3D inventing problem in the shielded domain. And the idea would have been to um, enforce some regularity assumption on the continuity of the wavefront side of our function. And what we liked of this approach is that we were uh, limiting the influence of deep learning. Uh, for which we still, for this work, we didn't provide any uh, thorough explanation, but we have a clearer concept of what is happening because uh, up to a certain point, we are, we are backed up by variational theory uh, results. And the idea is also that uh, this approach uh, actually um, applies uh, uh, almost straightforward to um, other limited or scarce uh, data CT problems. So it could be in principle applied to region of interest or exterior tomography, uh, which are other example of uh, real life application that uh, appear, in, uh, um, appear in our world. And, uh, um, and we could improve uh, uh, the limited angle case quite a lot. So now, for instance, we are working on a more realistic setup where the uh, wedge is way smaller. So the situation is more challenging. And if you think of, of breast homosynthesis, for instance, there phi is only 20 degrees. So the spanning angles is in total 40 degrees. And you sample 11, sometimes 13, depending on the, um, on the um, on the producer of the uh, sample lines, and of course, as I said, uh, we could improve way more on the on the on the network side. So consider most sophisticated loss function, which uh, have additional regularization or defining different loss function, for instance, in the Schiller domain or other other uh, in the image domain or more sophisticated ones with different similarities uh, uh, measures to assess uh, the quality of the reconstruction. Um, yeah, and I think with this, uh, thank you for listening. And I hope I'm not too much over time. And if you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you for the very nice talk. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Please uh, unmute yourself. and. I, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Okay. So actually I had 
two questions. I think they are related. I, I don't I don't know why, but let's try. So the first one is uh, at the beginning you said that uh, I mean if you look at the invisible parts of invisible part of the shear let coefficients, the when you apply the limited angle to mark you get exactly zero. Well, at the end you you wrote approximately zero. So I wanted to. That's just uh, uh, okay. So they are mathematically zero. Okay, so you can prove that they have to be zero. But then when you compute the shear let transform with a numerical software. They are like uh, very small, close to the epsilon precision, but they are never exactly zero. But right, I think sure. that's the numerical issue. Mm -hmm. But I mean, do you do you get exactly zero because you use particular shearlets like uh, band limited shearlets, or, or it's true in general? I, I think um, uh, I don't. I don't recall because Jurgen Frick proved the result for curvelets, and I don't recall which kind of curvelets he used uh, to prove the result. Mm. But uh, I recall that uh, it's exactly zero in his theorem. Uh, in his right. Mm. And so the second question is: Have you tried to to use Y itself for the network as well as the visible part of the reconstruction, or at least? I mean, without throwing, throwing away Y completely in the in the construction of, of the invisible part. So you mean giving also the limited angle sinogram in the network? Yeah, either the sinogram or something related to the sinogram, which is not only the visible, the, sorry, the visible part of the shearlet coefficients. Um, I think not, honestly. Not that I can recall. I don't think we ever tried that mm -hmm. on the many tests we did. Thank you.